He's uh, unquestionably one of the uh, toughest interviewers in TV. Has a reputation for getting the facts, the dirt, the goods where other people don't. Uh, he's a hard-hitting fellow, and um, he has a reputation for being simply um, a bad guy with some people. Often they are the people who have something to hide. Uh, he's one man I guess you wouldn't want as an enemy. So why take a chance and bring him out here, come to think of it? <laughs> Mike Wallace. Sure. Drama build up. <laughs> ow. Did, did you say ow? Yes, I have a, a busted wrist that just came out of a cast, and it's Ooh. a problem to button your... Ah. Or unbutton your coat. Yes. You broke it at that drunken, scandalous nude party, didn't you, Mike Wallace? <laughs> you know, as I, as I listened uh, to the introduction, I thought to myself, oh, come on, Dick. I mean, that is such old stuff. Horny old stuff, yeah. I know. Yeah. Nice but, fellow. But you're an older guy. So, Aging, that's you know, right. So. Aging, a little <laughs> over the hill. You mean, you mean nobody thinks of you as any of those things I anymore? I think that people should begin to be very nice to me. Yeah. <laughs> But there is still a difference between you and, say, Mr. Rogers, in terms of, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know what I would say, <clears throat> voltage, uh, um, so on. But the bad guy image, I don't know what you really did to deserve that. Uh, you've never... Um... It isn't so much a bad guy. There's been a certain, obviously, a certain insistence mm. on trying to get some answers mm -hmm. about things that have been reasonably researched ahead of time over a period of years. And yep. I must say, I must say, having, having said that... Uh, I, I don't resent the introduction, but I think it's... A little crummy. Simplistic. Sim the, uh, <laughs> uh, that it's a, it's a part of the territory that I self-consciously carved out ahead of time. I mean, I looked at mm. what reporters were like mm -hmm. and who was reasonably successful and what kind of thing I wanted to do and could do fairly effectively. Yeah. And so I said, okay, maybe I can find a niche for myself there. I'm not, let us say, the anchor type. No. What do you mean, no? <laughs> no, that... I, I mean, no, you're wrong. You are the anchor type. <laughs> uh, by the anchor type, do you mean the, the hairspray crowd, as I believe... No, 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 no. calls them the, the no. guys on uh, wit, Eyewitless News, or... Uh, no, the, 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 the anchor... The anchor is... Um, and in a sense, Dan rather broke that mold. Mm -hmm. The anchor is somebody who can be almost anybody's friend, can be almost believable to anybody, somebody that you want to invite into your home night after night after night to tell you what's going on. And I think that yeah. people like the rest of us, let's say Donaldson, Sam Donaldson over at ABC or somebody like myself, are a little more insistent, a little more abrasive. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want... <clears throat> Dan Rather or Donaldson in your home, whom else? Who else would you not no, invite I said, in here? No, I said that Dan Rather broke that mold oh, when mold. he became mm. a very successful anchor. Yeah. If you think back to the Nixon years, Sorry. for instance, when Dan was really taking on the president mm -hmm. and that confrontation down in Texas when um, Mr. Nixon asked Dan Rather after a tough question, are you running for something, Mr. Rather, and, the, and Dan snapped back, are and, you, sir? And you too, Mr. President. Exactly. You, sir? Yeah. Well, he's come a heck of a distance, as you can see, since then. By the way, did you kind of gasp when he said that? A little and think, bit. Oh, he forgot his neutral role that little somebody bit. decided everyone's supposed to have. <laughs> yeah. Did he find that, was that typical of him? Was that a moment of, where he slipped a bit? Did, did he have second thoughts? Or I think he did. Yeah. And I think that he probably, in effect, suffered for it for a certain number of years. Rather, did is he? a a really down-the-middle reporter. But when you are perceived as having moved out of line a little bit and confronted the uh, President of the United States, which, mm -hmm. ask him tough questions, but don't confront him on that basis, uh, he, he did suffer for it, it. In what way, though, really? I mean, there he is now. A lot of people would like to suffer as badly as he did. That's be. a lot of years ago. <clears throat> it's a yeah. lot of years ago when you think about it. But did um, any, any biggie at the network say, uh-oh, this guy think he is? Knock him down they, a couple of If they did, they never confided in me. Mm -hmm. He moved out of the White House shortly thereafter, went to CBS reports for a while, and then finally came to 60 Minutes. And I think that 60 yeah. Minutes, in a certain degree, probably helped him uh, to blanch out that other image because he would do a profile of Leopold Stokowski or a 
profile of, 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 of somebody else in which he had an opportunity to show that he had more than one string to his bow. Yeah, yeah, they did say to be a one noteness if you're not careful in that, in that job, I'm sure. But see, uh, you, you, you don't like to talk about the old days that much, I guess, but... Uh, oh, no. okay. See, I go back, to, I'm old enough to remember Nightbeat, as you know. Um, and that was, uh, for our viewers under 50, that was a uh, program in which for maybe the first time, people actually heard words on television they hadn't heard before. Yeah. Now, you once, this is, forgive me for being sort of Mike Wallacey here, but uh, you said once in an interview that we never asked a question just for shock effect, only to elicit information. That's one of your, your codes, I guess, and a good one. Um, however, I remember you're asking a well-known fashion designer, a Mr. male John. in those days, are you homosexual? Did now, I? Yeah. No, what information Wasi? other than that fact could you have... <laughs> well, the, th the thing that I remember from it was not any moral opprobrium on my part, uh, but the, simply the fact that I, I never... I didn't know they used that word on television. Right. It gives you some idea how things have changed. 1956, I mean, 57. Yeah. Th did I hear that right? That's People right. buzzed around. Did you hear what he said? And as Time Magazine said in an unforgivable pun, I suppose, or something, Mr. John minced words. I remember that, too. <laughs> Um, Somebody else said that Mr. John could have stuck Mike Wallace with his hat pin. That's right. That shows the kind of jokes people thought were funny in those days. <laughs> if you had that one to do over again, I mean, you would never do that now. Uh, I would hope that I would do that kind of thing, except that being a, a, a homosexual and in the fashion business is, is 30 yeah. years later. Yeah. Really, what difference does it make? Not much, of, not much news. But was there any sense in that time that you maybe did hurt his feelings, did scare him, did upset We remained him, good did... friends. Yeah. No, I don't think so. He was a grown fellow. Yeah. Do you have anything that corresponds to the actor's nightmare in your particular thing? You know, the, okay. actor who f the actor's nightmare is that you don't know your lines, or the student's nightmare is how did exam time get here and I haven't studied. What's my ever, next question you, going to be? Yeah, or are you ever in front of anybody in a dream and think, uh, who no. is this? Why did my mom... Because uh, I don't do what you do. You're sitting here without notes, with nothing in the world but that by your side. And, and, uh... <laughs> I can't. I don't. What I do is, when I'm going to do an interview, just a one-on-one -on -one interview, mm. not an investigation or a long exposition piece, mm -hmm. is I'll write myself at least 50 questions. R full out, full, full sentences. Out. On, on lined, uh -huh. yeah. legal Richard Nixon type paper. Yeah. And then always have it in front of me. I may not use more than half a dozen or eight of the questions in the course of, a, of an hour, mm -hmm. but I want it there. Let's say I want it there because it's a kind of security blanket yeah. for me. I would find myself naked doing what you're doing. Well, what interests me about that is why did you say Richard Nixon type paper? Legal. He, that's the kind of thing that he always used to work on. You associate, those long legal pads. You associate Nixon with legal. <laughs> <laughs> or is it the pattern of bars on the paper? There? We'll be back deeper into Mr. Wallace's psyche after this message. Dreams before. I was just wondering if you ever, if there was anything corresponding to the actor's dream in which you suddenly are out there and you can't think of, I can't remember any of my questions, I can't remember what I planned, I don't know who this person is, I don't know what it, but you, you're immune to that from that, from probably from your... Just from the crib sheet that I have in my lap. Tell me your dreams, Mike. What is your... <laughs> if I were your psychiatrist and I said, uh, did you dream last night or what's the last dream you remember? I don't remember them. I really don't. You're one and of those of people. Them, yeah, I just don't remember them. That's a hindrance in psychiatry, presumably, if you subscribe to that. Presumably. The, the, yeah. And over the years, I have found it to be. But, but... Uh, well, I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> well, from time to time. You go to a head candler, eh? Well, I have over yeah. a period of the last 30 years, from time to time. Yeah. For what, what I like to call spot therapy. If you've got some problem that nags and nags mm. and nags. Yeah. Uh, and you and you want to go and spend two hours if mm -hmm. he'll do it with you I yeah. find that it can be very helpful yeah I remember some years ago when I was having an episode of classic depression I read about you being hospitalized and because one tends to project this that was last when January you have it, I wondered if you had had any experience with that dreadful ailment 
It was in the middle of the Westmoreland trial. Yeah. I had taken a week off and gone to Ethiopia. And I, I don't know that I picked up a bug or just exhaustion there. And then came mm -hmm. back and it was a tough time. If you've never been on trial, and I had not, been, yes I had, I had been on one before, but just for a day or two. And, yeah. and it was a libel situation on the, a piece that I had done for the Cronkite News. And it had all come out right. But this thing was going on and on and on. And to mm -hmm. sit there in a courtroom and have yourself called nasty names without an opportunity to answer. And it's not a movie this time. That's right. Yeah. And you suddenly realize, I mean, that's what you're, if you are a reporter and your integrity mm -hmm. is called into serious question in a courtroom under oath by a man of substance, there can be no more, I can't understand or believe that there's any more trying thing. In any case, what happened was that I got the flu, at which wound up in just nervous exhaustion. So mm -hmm. I went did to the hospital the and stayed there for a week or ten days. Did you have the sense to go to the hospital yourself, or were you at that point where somebody had to say to you, Mike, you're talking about A little of paper. each. A little of each. Yeah. Interesting. Would you write about that in a book? This book, uh, my, uh, my Close Encounters, how do you think up a title like that? <laughs> is... is um, more professional and f interesting stuff. I wondered if you'd ever write a really very personal book about the, some of the tragedies of your life, some of the anxieties and that I sort of thing. I didn't sort feel of thing you I, were just talking about. I didn't feel, well, first, of mm -hmm. course, that hadn't happened by the time that I wrote True. the book. And in the paperback, which has just come out, I do write about the Westmoreland episode yeah, and the fact that the West that the Westmorelands, both General and Kitsy Westmoreland, his wife, was absolutely dear to me. When I first began to feel bad mm -hmm. in the courtroom and yeah. was persuaded it was the flu, Kitsy Westmoreland brought me apple juice and a couple of her special pills. And then when I wound up in the hospital, these people who had sued me and CBS for $120 million sent me the most beautiful bunch of flowers Jeez. imaginable. Where were we? Well, I was just saying, could you write a, a personal biography of the sort that often uh, would be the kind of thing that uh, I couldn't. undercuts what the uh, inquirer couldn't. might that's want to a, write That's about. a professional mm. yeah. uh, biography, autobiography. Yeah. And that's all that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably a little long, but yeah. I, mu I just reread it now that it's out in paperback, and I must say that some of it's moderately interesting. <laughs> It's nice to read something you've written, I think. <laughs> I gee, tell you. Years later, gee, this guy's good. It's Who all right. That? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've done that whenever I run across my books in a remainder shelf or somewhere. Uh, one of your sons died, and I don't remember how, and I knew once. It's interesting. Did I repress that? Was it a drowning accident? No, he was fell a... off a mountain in Greece. That's right. That's what it was. At, I was watching at the age the... of 19. Yeah. He, uh, Peter, he was at the end of sophomore year, I believe, at Yale. Mm -hmm. It was back in 1962. And he loved Greece from the time that he was a kid. And he was going to meet some yeah. friends there at the end of the summer. Went to a place called Zilakastron. And he was waiting for them. And he, there was a monastery up on the top of a mountain close by where the two nuns lived. And uh, he went to find them. And fell. Can you give anybody advice on how you give someone that kind of news, H how did you get it? If you ever find yourself in the position of having to inform someone of something like that, how do you do it? I don't know. I, I, There's no I, good way. I guess. No, no. I, we hadn't heard from him in a couple of weeks and three weeks, and so I went to look oh, yes. and found him. Yeah. And then I had to tell his mother. And I tell you, I, I don't know how you... Mm -hmm. I don't know how you, uh, there's no good way. Yeah. I, I've been told the phone company has instru often instructs people, uh, their operators to have a sort of formula, which in fact involves the phrase, are you sitting down? Really? In case people do, uh, and then say there's been an accident. All you can do is yeah. remember what's best and smother mm -hmm. the person that you've got to tell with love and yeah. understanding, but there's no good way. Yeah. I know a woman whose son was killed um, by a drunk driver. And even before that, I've always thought anyone caught drunk driving should get a mandatory year or two in jail, as I think they didn't want some country, no matter who they are. And um, 
Her reaction was something that if you gave an actress in an exercise, she'd say, this can't... Are you kidding? You'd never play it this way. You studied acting. This is a choice you wouldn't make, probably. She was working in the kitchen, and if someone called and said, Don, or his name has been killed by a traffic accident, she said, that isn't true. And hung up the phone and continued to wash dishes and put things away and hmm. so on, and she didn't know. And then suddenly, wham! She just went berserk. But minutes later, maybe, you know, sometime later, luckily there was someone there to calm her down. In fact, they did a good thing, she said. They said, here, break some dishes, throw things, and she did. But no, no good way, as you say. What's the last big laugh you got on 60 Minutes? <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> my, listen to this. Uh, gosh. Now, I sometimes wondered if you had decided it's almost to... It's the happiest to, darn shop. The it people really who work there, apparently, uh, I think almost anybody in broadcasting would love to work that show. Am I wrong? No. There are 60 and 70 people in that shop. Mm -hmm. And we've been on the air. We're entering our 18th year. And I tell you, well, first of all, an indication of the kind of shop it is, there's been almost no turnover, really, over a period of the last 18 years. Uh, people just like to work there. It's run by a guy by the name of Don Hewitt, whom you've talked with, right. who was a wonderfully enthusiastic person to work with. Mm -hmm. And Reasoner and Safer and Bradley and Sawyer are all good. Um, yeah. It's a good, happy family. Do you find this guy Chris Wallace, uh, uh, um, what, what kind of advice would you give him to improve his work on, <laughs> on television? The guy using your last name. Chris is a much better prepared reporter, I must say, than I was when I started out. He's a good reporter, yeah. isn't he? Y yes, and, and, <laughs> and a dear friend of mine. <laughs> Gee, Mike, we went through your mail, we went through your garbage for three weeks. Couldn't and, find. And uh, we've run out of time, and there won't be time to reveal the sordid stuff we found there. Could you come back sometime when we can do that? Dick. <laughs> that means yes? <laughs> Good to see you. We'll be back right after this.